Hey y'all, Zach here from World of Game Design. Today we're going to take a left turn from the complexity of systems like Dune and Alien and are committing fully to showing you how to play a rules light, gut punch of an attitude RPG called Monster of the Week. I was introduced to this rule system when my home game was taking a break from D&D and one of the players piped up and said they'd love to run us through a funky system they'd just learned. We all agreed and got our first taste of this bizarre, flexible, energetic game. It's stupid easy to learn, so much so that as a player, I can't imagine a world where you ever need to buy a book and all the rules you need are on a couple sheets of paper. I think even the Keeper will find this to be a system that requires little in the way of references. What you shouldn't hear here is that there's not a lot of resources available for the game. There's loads, and the rule book itself is chock full of prompts, notes, and ideas to make your games even better. We talk all about that in our Should You Play video as well. You can check that out by clicking on the link above. This is a game that is an absolute blast and is perfect for one-shot filler sessions. Everyone should have, in my opinion, a Monster of the Week scenario in their back pocket. So let's help you get yours. As a fast reminder, these how to play videos aren't meant to be all encompassing. I'm only trying to give you enough information that you feel comfortable sitting down at the table and giving it a go. That said, I have a feeling we're going to cover just about every facet of this game today. Let's get to it. In Monster of the Week, you're trying to emulate serialized stories where a new monster features regularly. Think Buffy, Supernatural, Scooby Doo. Your party is a team of monster hunters, and the Keeper is going to run you through a mystery scenario each week that's like a new episode of TV featuring a new monster. Just like the shows it's emulating, you'll find that this game has a loose formula for how it's often ran. There's a setup where a mystery is introduced, then there's an investigation where the party picks up clues about the particular features of the monster they're hunting this week, and then there's a climactic encounter at the end where the monster is fought and either killed, banished, or captured. And next session, we'll come back and do it all over again. Part of the charm will likely be the repetitive, formulaic nature of the sessions. It's popcorn gaming, where half the fun is committing to the tropiness and nostalgia and trying to insert as many lines from your favorite shows as possible. It's often lighthearted, and the rules support a loose style of play that emphasizes theater of the mind and fast, dynamic descriptions of action. Nothing ever stands still in this game. With every roll of the dice, the story is meant to move forward. Speaking of dice, you'll only ever be rolling two six-sided dice and adding the results plus a tiny modifier or two. On a rolled six or less, whatever you're attempting to do is going to fail. On a seven to nine, it succeeds, but with consequence. On a ten or higher, it not only succeeds, but does so with gusto. It's important to note, however, that failing doesn't mean nothing happens. Something always happens when the dice are rolled in this system. The keeper will call the shot if you fail, detailing that failure pushes the story forward. It's probably worth noting here that this is largely the same system as the Root RPG, Masks, City of Mists, and other games that use the Apocalypse World Engine. In this system, the keeper doesn't roll any dice. This is another system that relies on the randomness to come from the players. Whoever is running the game just needs to focus on the storytelling and helping the players know when and where to roll dice. We'll talk more about rolling dice here in a minute with combat. But first, let's take a look at what player characters, or hunters, are like. Each player will take on the role of a hunter and will choose from one of numerous playbooks. There's a dozen different playbooks in the core book, but loads more to be found in additional supplements. Playbooks offer archetypes based off your favorite heroes and anti-heroes from the plethora of monster-based tales and TV shows. You could choose to play something largely human, like the expert, or the wronged, or even the mundane. Or you can even go the bizarre route and select the monstrous, the spooky, or anything in between. The lineup of playbooks that your group takes on will largely determine the feel of the campaign. Some might be more schlocky fun, others almost comedically intense, while others may even get particular in their genre as you build characters from playbooks that allow you to run a, a Hellboy-inspired campaign full of monstrous hunters hunting monsters, for example. 
Once you've selected your playbook, you'll move on to an actual character creation. Each playbook is two pages long and is comprised of both character generation and the day-to-day -day character sheet for that archetype. Let's take a quick peek and see what that looks like. Every character has five ability ratings, charm, cool, sharp, tough, and weird. And we'll get to put a modifier in each one from negative one to plus two. Different playbooks offer different combinations of ratings to choose from. If you're playing a monstrous character, they probably get more consistent bonuses to tough and weird, but there's always room to play something outside the norm. From there, you'll walk through and pick your moves, which are special abilities that your playbook gets access to. Also, you'll pick your gear, which is not always wholly unique, but always true to character. And then some additional details like physical peculiarities and clothing. It's step by step and each sheet offers very clear guidance. By the time you finish with character creation, you're going to have a really good idea for what this character looks like. And with the number of playbooks available, you can pretty much build exactly the hunter that you're imagining. Once you're done with that, the whole team comes back together just in time for one of my favorite bits of the system, Hunter History. In the history section of character creation, the group goes around and each person takes a turn connecting their hunter to another hunter by way of bullet point lists of options detailed on each character sheet. Maybe you choose the person on your left to be an old friend that you trust completely, but the person across from you has a bullet point that they choose to apply to you that says that you two are spouses uh, and maybe you've drifted apart lately. This is really great for making the party jive together from the very beginning, and it injects some of the most incredible personal moments into nearly every session. Top marks. Another cool aspect of the system, which we won't cover heavily, is the idea of leveling, and where you sometimes then snag abilities from other playbooks, giving you the opportunity to build a very unique character even with a, within a particular archetype. Maybe you're playing a monstrous character, but you really like some of the ideas, some of the abilities outlined in the expert, so you kind of grab some of those and weld them in. In addition, just like in Dead Halt, which we covered recently, you gain experience largely from failing on a move test. So if you want to level up and get more abilities, suck at what you're doing right now. This brings us to the meat of the system, which we'll call moves. All hunters share a set of basic moves, and then the special moves detailed on their individual playbooks. Anytime the keeper determines you're utilizing a move, a roll must be made. As long as your actions don't fall under a move, you can assume that what you want to do will probably work within reason. Moves, though, always require a roll of 2d6, as mentioned earlier, and this Hunter Reference Sheet walks you through how to resolve each move. This is a free resource, by the way, and every hunter should have access to it at all times to make things easy. The basic moves for Monster of the Week are Kick Some Ass. It uses your toughness rating, or your tough rating, and is what you'll be rolling in a fight. We'll cover combat more in just a minute. Next is Act Under Pressure. It uses the cool rating and is for things like defusing a bomb, or driving a car through a high-speed chase. Uh, help Out uses Cool as well, and is for when you want to help another hunter with their own move. Investigate a Mystery uses Sharp. It's when you're trying to gain clues, information, or guidance. Manipulate someone. This one uses Charm and their simple rules for NPCs, as well as manipulating other hunters, which is kind of cool. I like that on a miss, the other hunter gets to decide how badly you annoy or offend them. Fine. Uh, then you have Protect Someone. It uses Tough. It is surprisingly important, as there always seems to be an innocent bystander stuck in harm's way. I believe he said his name was Millicent mm. Bystander. Two more to go. There's Read a Bad Situation. This uses Sharp and is for when you're under threat and you need an answer fast. Not to be confused with Act Under Pressure, Reading a Bad Situation is about acquiring information, while Acting Under Pressure is about, well, acting. Finally, we come to the weird one. Literally. Use Magic uses the weird stat and lets you describe the magic that you want to make manifest in the world. Mundane, imperfect magic is somewhat easy to make happen, while earth-shattering magic will be difficult for almost anyone. There's even a sub-move called Big Magic for magic that will take more time. 
This one might have you taken by surprise if you were thinking of Scooby-Doo or Fringe for your kind of emulated example. But it's right in line with Supernatural, Hellboy, and the like. If it doesn't work for the universe your group wants to play in, I recommend just reflavoring Use Magic as happenstance or fate or something. The point is that it adds chaos and ensures that the Keeper can never quite be sure how the scene is going to play out. Believe it or not, that's basically it, but we'll cover the basics of combat before we head out. Fights don't add much in the way of complexity in this game. It is, after all, just one of your basic moves, and a combat typically starts when someone says they want to kick some ass. From there, the initiative flows however the Keeper and Hunter's desire, typically letting all players have a chance to go before starting back at the beginning. The monsters could get actions themselves, but typically those are things that are doing that they're doing that the party will want to interfere with, say, maybe casting a spell or tearing down a building. Monsters don't use moves in the same way as characters. Remember, it's only the hunters that will be rolling the dice. So, how does a monster deal damage to a character? Well, that comes nearly every time a player, or hunter, rolls the kicks some ass dice. On a six or less, the hunter deals no damage. But the monster deals damage by the keeper choosing one of its abilities. So you rolled and chose to attack, but because you failed, you didn't deal damage, but the monster does damage to you. If the hunter rolls a 7 to 9 instead, the player deals damage, and the monster deals damage as well. It uses its ability, you use yours, you reduce hit points as required. On a 10 to 11, the hunter deals damage and can choose an additional effect to happen, one of which is to receive less damage in turn. On a 12 or higher, usually only available for leveled hunters, you can even negate all damage, but that's a story for a different time. Once the monsters burn through all their HP, they die. Same goes for hunters, but every hunter also has a luck pool that they can spend to avoid damage or roll an automatic 12. That said, luck recharges very slowly, so you can't rely on it with regularity. It's about as simple as that. Every time a player rolls a kick some ass move, damage will be dealt by one or more parties. This also incentivizes hunters to do things in conflict that aren't just kicking ass. Maybe you want to help out, or read a bad situation instead, perhaps giving you a key advantage while at the same time avoiding taking a hit. A nefarious keeper will likely have fun ongoing damage dealing effects during a combat though, ensuring that even if you're not kicking ass, the fight isn't going to go on indefinitely. In summary, Monster of the Week combat should be fast, easily adjudicated, and very deadly. I'd say most conflicts will wrap up in a handful of fast turns, which is great because that means they aren't going to devour half your gaming session like some of the other systems we know. Here at the end, I'll stress again how useful it is to have each player holding a hunter reference sheet. It's an incredible tool that keeps them from asking a thousand questions about how an ability works or what the result for rolling a certain number means. Everything is cleanly spelled out and keeps the game on pace. I'll put a link to the reference docs in the show notes below. That's it, folks. That's the video. If this has caught your interest and you're considering running a scenario or two, you can definitely run those found within the core rulebook, but I'll also recommend Crit Show's absolutely delightful adventure must be 230, featuring tooth fairies. I'll also uh, recommend the scenario called Frosty Reception. I found it on DriveThruRPG. Both make for excellent one-shots. The Crit Show one is free, and the Frosty Reception is just a couple bucks. Well worth your money if you don't have a story of your own that you're itching to tell. If you like this video, consider subscribing to our channel. We have a lot of great content and different playlists, all centered around getting you into more RPGs and making those games better. We also have a podcast, it's called Geeks Camp, and it features myself and a couple of my Yahoo Game Master friends chatting about topics that came up at our tables, Kickstarters, RPG news, and interviewing creators by the dozens. Go give us a listen if podcasts are your thing. It's also recorded live right over on Twitch and Facebook every week. You can expect a video like this about a different system every few weeks. Until then, we'll see you next time.